going to start out with a tune called Frank's Girl. I don't think that's the big thing, Mike. We don't think. We just go. If you start thinking, <clears throat> especially when you're playing free jazz like we do, free improv, if you start thinking, then you're not you're not going to play. So it's got to be an emotional movement. You know what I'm saying? Something that happens just on instinct. It's not like when you play standard tunes or tunes, you know, you're reacting to what's on the paper or what's already established. But playing free like this requires a, a completely clear mind in order for it to function. I think the beauty of music is that it can convey truth. So I'm always, I guess the fundamental emotion I'm trying to, to, to convey through music is just sincerity. That's it. Like, this is as true as I can be. This is who I am. This is what tickles my brain. I'm never trying to be like, what, is, what are you going to like? Or how can I convince you to do this or think this or feel that? Like, that's not how it works. Well, you, you get a feeling in uh, you, you about the situation, and then you, it's, you get a mood that happens, and then you write around that mood. You write chords that resemb resemble that mood. Now, on a given night, am I gonna sit here and think about when I'm playing on the tune, the housing uh, eviction notices and all that? No, we transcend that when we're playing, but my initial feeling is something like that. Uh, well, my home is the lily pad, so I was able to continue to play with my group every Wednesday, just like we normally do. We just played earlier and for longer. <laughs> if you can imagine, I was actually doing jam sessions with a bass player from Malmö, Sweden, a drummer from Germany, a piano player from uh, Newton, and trying to play music together with latency. In other words, they're here, my, the note that I'm playing comes out two seconds later, but we're still trying to play a music like a, a Rubato. So, in a lot of ways, I got to practice a lot more because I was stuck here and no one else could play here because we were closed. So I had uh, just way, way more access to the piano, which was, in a lot of ways, great for me musically. Well, for me, it was even better because I was secluded in my home, so <clears throat> it gave me a chance to practice every day. <laughs> I grew up thinking about this country as uh, like the best place in the world to live, and the land of opportunity, a lot of the stuff that we were sold growing up, which it is in a lot of ways, but what I didn't sort of see, at least not uh, explicitly, was uh, how much injustice there is right in front of me and how clear, and then I think the pandemic and the, 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 the polarization that it, it exposed was, was a surprise to me. I, think it's, I mean, everything that's happening is coming out and not playing now. I mean, so much has gone down. Plus, you got to remember, I grew up in the 60s as a teenager, <clears throat> so a lot of this was happening then. And I experienced a lot of what's happening now back then, so it's kind of like a recurrence, and it's pretty much always been like that. Now it's just coming to the forefront more. Well, it's not only the pandemic being home alone that changed it, there's a lot of other things that are going on in my life. Like my mother, who's 94, she's on her deathbed. She's got stage four lung cancer. Uh, and I've had a lot of pe friends pass away or 
things like that. So you just put kind of everything in perspective in, uh, in this one day at a time. And then, of course, you see the news like the big lie and all the, uh, the propaganda about wear a mask, don't wear a mask, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, uh, about the vaccine and all the, the restrictive voting uh, uh, laws that they're trying to put in place. It's kind of, it's a little scary. Well, for me, it made me realize that it could be taken away from you. So I think a lot of us felt this way, that not being able to play, uh, it was a privilege to play. And then when, when we had this year where we couldn't play, there was no gigs. <clears throat> I think it made a lot of us realize what we have and what we have to cherish and you know, make sure that it's not always going to be there. The things that come to mind is I'm grateful that people are listening. Because uh, there's so many wonderful players in this world and so few listeners. So the fact that anybody is listening and appreciating to what, to any degree, I'm humbled. Uh, do I get nervous? No. Because this is, is I'm going to play as well as I can play. And uh, this is what's coming out in the moment. That's the, art, that's the art of jazz. It's in the moment music. But I'm just thankful to be up there playing. Yeah, but you know what? You, 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 it makes you <clears throat> realize you've got to learn how to deal. You know, if you crap out and just give up, then you blow. You know what I mean? You've got to figure out what do I need to do to keep my head together? You know what I mean? What do I need to do? What do I need to do to continue to exist? Because we've had it so good all these years. And then all of a sudden, someone threw a wrench in the works. And now you got to deal with it. You know, what do you need to do personally to keep your shit together? That's what. Sorry. No, that's what. Does gas help you with that? Oh, are you kidding me? I, every Monday night we come, we, we, and this has been going on for 50 years. You know, we'd play all week and teach, and then we'd come Monday night and then get the energy organized again so that we can get through the rest of the week. They're just waiting for the numbers to be a certain level, is what I remember. Like, the number of cases to get down and stay down at a certain level for, cer for a certain length of time. And then they said, go ahead. And so we reopened, and the Fringe was the first band to play. George and, and Jay were the first people to play. I think it was June 14th. And then we never, and then that process we basically had two shows that week and then like four shows the next week and then like six shows the next week and then we were back up to normal within uh, about two months we were back up to normal. When I was, when I first came to Boston I heard about the Fringe and I went to see them at, oh I can't remember the name of it, it was in Somerville and, and Powderhouse, near pa ba Ball Square I think. I can't remember the name of the restaurant. Totally shady place, like full on mob. I think they were selling drugs out of the other side. And and then they were at and then the fringe was at the Lizard Lounge, and I and I used to teach out like door to door in Concord, Weston, and Sudbury. And so every day I would go out and teach like ten lessons and then come home at like 10, 10 p.m. And on Monday nights I would just drive right by. Um, the, the Lizard Lounge, and I would go and sit in the front row of the Fringe every Monday and just listen to George, and the whole band, obviously, but George in particular, because uh, he was doing stuff I'd never heard anyone do before. And then, eventually, they lost that gig, and then they've been here since, which has been, because um, it was before it was even the Lily Pad, so that was 2005, I think, they started playing, so they've been here for 16 years already. <laughs> It's um, why do you play jazz still? You know, why do you still play the saxophone? You've been playing, you know, forever. You've been professional forever. You know. Why, why do I still do it? Yeah. What else am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what I do. I mean, I was, I 
think I was like, like Jerry Bravanzi, I was born to play the saxophone. You know, some people do this, they do that. And you know, I grew up in a musical family, so this is what I do. You know, this is all I do. I mean, I do other things, but as far as my profession, I'm a professional saxophonist. Like Bravanzi, I mean, he, these guys are my idols. Bravanzi and um, Joe Lovano, Dave Liebman. You know, when you grow up with people like that around you, you realize there's like levels of uh, attainment that you could get just by listening to them. That's what I did. Well, I think I always, well, I'm a really intuitive person. I don't like remembering facts, uh, which was, I don't like documenting things very much either. And I love improvisation, just period. It doesn't matter if it's in music or in sports or in anything, making up stories, whatever. I just like that part of uh, life. And I don't really consider myself like really a truly a jazz musician because I don't know the idiom. I feel like a real true jazz pianist knows a thousand tunes. Easy. In every key, it's just totally comfortable for them. And that's not me. I'm, I'm not me. Yeah. Musicians have to play. You know, and uh, a friend of mine said, you know, I can't wait till I get a gig at Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center. Uh, wherever I'm going to play, that's going to be the place. The, uh, in the present tense, playing music for the universe, you know, for the, not only that we have like 20 or 30 people listening, but there's, we're sending the music out there for all the people who aren't listening out to the, so, uh, it's still a thrill for me. It's still a thrill to play music. I keep telling people that uh, I believe in reincarnation. Next lifetime, I want to do the same damn thing. I just want to play music.